This is Craig Zelzer with Kiran Singh Sira here for episode 11, no, season 11, episode 5, got that backwards, of the Social Change Career Podcast. We're going to be talking about storytelling for impact and careers at the intersection of narrative, social change, and more. Um, for people who have not joined us for a podcast before, this will go about one hour, and we would love, whether it's the beginning or throughout the podcast, to hear where you're watching from. Just put your, please feel free to share a few sentences about your background in the LinkedIn comments, and please bring in your questions as we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, the, uh, this will be up as a PCDN podcast within two weeks, and it will be about one of 120 other episodes of the Social Change Career Podcast. So please check it out. And just two asks. So if you like the podcast, please consider sharing and rating. It helps grow our reach and impact. And then please follow Kiran and International Storytelling Center and Alliance for Peace Building and Generations for Peace and PCDN on LinkedIn or your favorite channel. So I'm going to summarize Kiran's bio because I will not read the whole thing. Um, but basically, Kiran is a multifaceted change maker specializing in storytelling, peace building, and cultural advocacy. He was the past president, recently stepped down of the International Storytelling Center, which will certainly tell us a lot about, but it's one of the world's leading centers for the power of storytelling and community. Um, he's led globally recognized programs that have earned accolades from UNESCO and the European Commission. He's a former Rotary Peace Fellow, did his master's at UNC Chapel Hill. So we're definitely gonna dive into the Peace Fellowship. He also has a master's in museum studies from University of Newcastle. Um, he's also a senior fellow for storytelling at Alliance for Peace Building and also does a lot of work with Generations for Peace USA. He's a sought after speaker and change maker. He's addressed institutions like the Library of Congress, the US Senate, and even the White House. Um, he's collaborated with artists like Yo Yo Ma and Dolly Parton, and he's been honored as a champion of peace by Rotary International at the United Nations. He's not just an advocate for storytelling as a tool for social empathy, he sees it as a form of social change itself. His work is rooted in the belief that storytelling can bridge divides and inspire action, making him a pivotal figure in community building and social justice. Um, Kiran, thank you for joining us from Tennessee. I'm based in Medellin, Colombia. I'm just going to welcome a few people. And again, throughout this, please let us know where you're watching from, bring in your comments. So welcome Joe from Hong Kong, the Impact NFT Alliance. So feel and feel free also to post a you know, couple of sentences or bullet points about your work or your websites. Anita, welcome from South Africa. Welcome another user from South Africa. Um, please keep letting us know where you're watching from and your comments. So Kieran, thank you so much for making time out of your morning to join us. Absolutely, it's great to be here, Craig. Thank you. And can you share a little bit about like, what is the theme or the how, how is your career weaved together? Is there a central focus? You know, is it all, always about the power of storytelling for social change or how would you describe the path of your career? Um, the path of my career, you know, it's interesting because the thread of storytelling has always been there, but the thread of creativity and cultural expression and artistry has always been core to the work, I think. You know, and it's one of these paths that, you know, you don't quite know what what's next, but that's the, you know, part of the faith is knowing that it will be okay as long as you've got the conviction uh, and the belief that, you know, we're all, all interconnected as a human family. So. You know, there's been a lot of moments where I've like just taken a chance or gone to a place and didn't know anyone. Um, I don't know. I just and I think, you know, for me as a kid, when I was a young boy, I was terrible at math. You know, I was terrible at those those things. And even in English, you know, when I was made to kind of write and my handwriting was terrible, I found out I was dyslexic. And but when I discovered the oral tradition, the spoken word tradition and and artistry. I always wanted to be an artist, and, and I consider myself an artist in everything. So, artistry, creativity, culture is core to everything, and all these different paths. I never, when I was a tiny, you know, five year old, didn't say I want to run a storytelling center. I didn't know that existed, um, but stories have always been really much part of it because of you know also coming from a very strong um, traditional you know, family that's crossed three continents and from the son of refugees, it's core to who we are, you know? And so it's always been a big influence, but, you know, whatever part we are in our career, we look back and we think about what are the moments that have influenced or informed who we've become. 
And I would say, you know, when I look back through the lens of storytelling, there's so many of these stories, mentors, teachers inspired me. And I've never really been money motivated. It's nice to have some money, but it's really about this goal and idea of how do we make our world a better place? And that's been core to everything. Um, thank you so much. So I can just welcome a few more people. Abdi is an old friend. He, we studied together at George Mason. He's based in Nairobi. He does a lot of amazing work in peace building East Africa. Alexandra from Boca Raton, um, Ramin from Washington, D.C., Andre from Luxembourg, um, oops, just, um, Tog, Tog from Nigeria, Raj from Boulder, and Stephanie. So welcome, everybody. Again, feel free to share a few sentences about your work and bring in questions. Um, so when you said, when you thought about a younger age, I mean, I, my younger age is like, I wanted to, I was always interested in social change and always interested in business, you know, so at some point I thought I wanted my own ski, I used to ski a lot too, I wanted my own ski mountain, but then like, that's not social conscious enough, but, you know, <laughs> but I've always been interested in that intersection of social change and business. So when you thought about at a younger age, being an artist, you know, when you, and the research shows it's important not to ask kids what they want to be because that can be very limiting like to define themselves in a narrow path but more like what interests them or what passions or challenges they want to work on so if you think back to a younger age when you thought about being an artist did you want to be a rapper a writer an actor or you just knew artist and then kind of the idea of storytelling emerged later i think right in the early beginnings it was probably a visual artist you know my father was an architect and my mother were a nurse and so I'd always like sit at home and wait for my dad to come back and uh, from from work. And I wanted to show him my artwork. He bought me a sketchbook when I was a kid. And late at night, my dad would be working on the drawing board. You know, he's a traditional architect, you know, with the, you know, technical with the drawing board. And I just loved drawing. I loved to make sense of the world. But I, it was the visual arts to begin with, which then all the arts are interconnected and visual arts first but then storytelling came part of that spoken word became part of that poetry um it's ultimately even in my work in museums it's artistry is all about the way we see the world how we make sense of the world how we transcend the everyday mundane um and get to kind of almost like to the core of who we are our humanity the world around us it's it's about thinking it's about philosophy it's about um the rhythm that exists within inside of us and how we express that to someone else storytelling emerged as part of that but when i think of storytelling i i have a very broad definition it's the multiple ways that we create the multiple ways we express who we are what we believe our values to the world it's not just the oral tradition it's the bumper stickers we put on our car it's the way we decorate our front porch it's the rituals and performances we practice as part of our faith or cultural traditions it's this multi it's the food ways it's the recipes it's 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 all these things that really encompass and um so it's the broader idea of storytelling of who we are where we come from but also how we envision the world that we want to be part of or we want to create it's so. wonderful um welcome faith from nigeria sabina from buffalo um, and lots of other people please feel free to start bringing your questions so just curious, do you, if you have a car or you can think about your front porch, do you have any bumper stickers on your car that you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, actually, it's funny. I did. I When I had my last Subaru, I had a sticker from um, the Friends Committee for National Legislation, the Quaker funding lobby group. And it says, um, love thy neighbor, no exceptions. <laughs> and I love that. I love That's that. That's a good sticker. one. A bumper sticker. Yeah, if people don't know the Friends Committee of National Legislation or American Friends Service Committee or, you know, in the UK, Quaker Peace and Service, um, really interesting organizations and historic faith churches uh, that are really working a lot on peace building. Correct. This is the one in DC, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's more it's more policy focused, but it's, you know, um, so if you think back to your undergraduate training and your graduate training and kind of defining art and social change, and I, I think you might know, I did my PhD on, on um, theater and peace building and music in Bosnia. So, and I, you know, I'm, I have some little bit of talent at improv theater. I'm a horrible visual artist. You know, if I start drawing my, I can't even draw a stick figure, but if you think about how much of the skill of storytelling and empathy and communicating in all different formats and organizing 
how much, how many of those skills did you just have innately based on your upbringing and genetics and interest? And what kind of skills did you develop through your university career that you think help you in your job today or your consulting work? Um, I'd say it's somewhat both. I'm not sure. It's one of these things where I, I my mother was my primary teacher, I would say, and she was incredibly artistic and and a thinker and she encouraged me to read and to write and to draw and to make um as well you know so i just it's part of this thing where i think it was david attenborough the great filmmaker just said like know what your passions are and follow them and everything will begin to align you know i i had this desire to go to college art college um and I think a lot of that, you know, I, mean, I spent four years in an undergraduate making visual arts and you had a studio. It was really less academic and more this open space where you get to create and make, answer questions. You know, you, you, you're exploring life and ideas, you know, from birth to death. And, you know, you're exploring transition and and all these things help you think about the world. I mean, it's it's not necessarily a skill. It's really sort of getting to the core of how how one can sort of see the world, imagine the world, explore possibilities. And it it gave you this very sort of, it's really like, I believe it's sort of maybe sort of harnessing, cultivating something that already exists within all of us. You know, it's, we all are artists. And so I would, I would I would fight back on that idea of you're not good at, it's, we're all artists. Drawing is art. Collaboration is art. And it's how we harness that, you know, if we want to run a marathon, then we have to run every day. And if you want to write, you have to write every day. And when we think about stories in our life, we have to tell a story every day. That was very prominent in my family. It was, you know, a lot of my family um, would sit up throughout the night and tell stories, sing ballads, folk songs. And so when you're completely exposed to that, you you realize the beauty in it. And so the, the college degrees or whatever it was really something that I just wanted to do and I love to do and but it was through that process and I think it was a moment where I was in I finished my undergrad then I did a one-year teacher training art education post that and when I got my first classroom assignment in a in a high school in in Leicester in England what I was doing was not necessarily, what I realized I was doing was not necessarily teaching about these sort of white European artists, Michelangelo and et cetera. But I was creating this space where kids who hadn't seen their parents for two weeks or they were facing sort of life challenges was how to cultivate their voice, create a safe space for expression. And that's when I started seeing the beauty of what the arts really can do for society starting at that kind of that that space you know um so it was a kind of a progression and then obviously right after that i moved to scotland landed a job at the museum of scotland the national museums of scotland i was 24 and then september the first i got a job i was 25 at the national museum of scotland with a a mission to present the world to scotland and the world and, and and scotland to the world 10 days later 9-11 occurred and so now my job was really about how do we create these spaces to engage with communities that have felt disconnected marginalized isolated um and i met this education specialist that once said if you really want to bring culture to people then break down the walls of the museum and let people come and take what rightfully belongs to them as a metaphor the museum means something it's a very almost in the sense it's a very Western institution. And as a product of empire, you know, whose side was I on? Who, what objects do we interpret? Who interprets them? And a lot of my thinking began starting to think about how do we relinquish power from the institution and rightfully give culture interpreted to the people who are, have a meaningful cultural connection to those objects and to that material and intangible aspects. So that led to creating a faith-based festival inside the museum where we kind of almost broke down the walls of the museum and explored issues, topics, ideas. And that's when storytelling sort of started to really emerge 
for me anyway, starting to see the power of storytelling, of what happens when uh, we can explore our faith narratives, our cultural narratives, but also our personal. And for me, that was sort of wondering, I started to see the power of that more than policies or strategic plans. You know, so, you know, that that's what the realization was. And I, I, I like to think of this idea that, you know, take a strategic plan and a policy, take it to a neighborhood and give it to a five year old. They wouldn't know what to do. But give that kid a canvas and a blank wall and some paint and ask them to paint their future. You're going to have a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. The idea of accessibility and recognizing that wisdom exists in all communities, cultural knowledge, ideas, they exist in communities. There's beauty in even in despair. And I feel my part of my role is to be a sort of facilitator for that to help to cultivate some of that, that those ideas. Wonderful. Um, welcome, Helen, from South Sudan, um, and lots of communicators who are watching and engaging. So feel free to share your stories and tips. And again, please, we'd love to bring in your questions, not just here where you're watching from. And so, Kieran, so how in the world did you go from, I mean, one, could you share a little bit more in terms of the Festival of Communities or Interfaith Festival in the National Museum of Scotland? Like, was there, was there resistance from some people? Like, oh my gosh, like, this is not what a museum should do. Or people are like, this is amazing. Let's try it and see where it goes. And, you know, so a little bit like, I guess a right. question is like, the idea is both you and your peers and community members, when you're trying to break down, you know, what is defined as formal culture and just everybody has power and stories and voice and who gets to define that. So, so how have you found like kind of bringing whether it's at the National Storytelling Center or the museum or at UNESCO or the UN, you know, how have you tried to break down boundaries with others? And are people like, this is amazing, or no, this is too hippie, people hugging trees? Like, how have you kind of navigated that path? Yeah, I mean, when I worked at the National Museum of Scotland, I started at 24 years old, 25 years old. The National Museum was one place, but then I think the greatest learning that I had more than any degree was moving to the city of Glasgow. Glasgow is a very blue collar city. It's 3 million people. It's a place where you find faces weathered with stories to tell deep social history. That was my learning. Um, it was also a very progressive city where they really valued the arts and creativity and culture. So when I got a job after the national and moved to facilitating as a social justice curator for a city, now 13 museums 40 libraries and my job was to kind of this is also a period of time when it was a social inclusion policy under the labor government so people came first ideas came first and i was an educator it wasn't we start with this numismatic collections we start with people and ideas and the idea of this social history so i started to do kind of things where i was thinking a lot about okay so here we have 360 gangs in the city how are we meeting them? How are we addressing those issues? How are we allowing young people to kind of cultivate their voice? You know, much like that classroom experience, it's like if people are given the chance to cultivate their voice, they can be heard, which is an incredible step to feeling validated and a sense of belonging. We need that for everyone. And so I did this sort of this gang reconciliation work using museum spaces. Now, did it meet with resistance? It wasn't. I had a very, I would say a lot of really progressive, forward-thinking bosses without really believed in those ideas. So the first time I did it, it broke out into an all-out war, right? But rather than say, no, don't do it now, they were like, okay, here's more resources, here's more money, here's more social workers, do it again. And so I had that encouragement and this idea that you try something, it may not go right the first time, but you try it again. That particular program expanded. And next thing you know, we're working with ex-paramilitary groups from Northern Ireland. We're working with police, the UDA, the Orange Order, and expanded into a program where about 10,000 people participated in that project. Um, and I think it was really much like the idea of thinking that culture belongs to everyone. And whether you're a peace builder, a policymaker, your culture is so important. It's when we think about the divisions, conflict, society, we're all cultural diversity officers. It's not just a few people that are responsible. We all are. If you work in culture, then you're, everybody's a cultural diversity officer. 
and really thinking about that idea. So when I started to think about, you know, the collaborations with like peace building organizations and social justice and even the police, you know, I asked these police officers, I said, what do you do when a kid commits a first time offense? And they said, oh, we get them to paint the railway station. I said, well, what, how are we cultivating their voice? I said, well, why don't you send them to me instead? I employed a bunch of artists and these kids thought they were being punished, but they were coming into the museum and they're turning vernacular forms of graffiti into now I'm giving them a canvas and saying your voice matters. How do you vision your city? And we'll display this artwork alongside Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross, one of the most iconic religious paintings. And when you see the kids face change, they've been accepted, they've been validated, their sense of belonging, then you see change occur in society. So it was really about kind of recognizing that the museum isn't a four walls, it's all, it's society. For many communities, it's the shrine, it's the home, it's the community, it's the intangible. And thinking beyond that, um, and also recognizing that these institutions are somewhat hierarchical. If you go to the British Museum to this day, European arts at the top, Africa is relegated to the basement. We had to challenge that as people worked in pro as products of empire. There were some of us that were like, that's not right. That's incorrect. What, what, what message does that send? And so we started to challenge these ideas and started to say, well, well perhaps what we need to do is relinquish power, relinquish control, and allow people to interpret their own stories in their own ways, in ways that are meaningful for them without control. So that's been a big part of that. But um, obviously doing that sort of peace building work inside a museum or cultural space led to um, the opportunity to become a Rotary Peace Fellow, the understanding of folklore and traditions, and to harness that, which eventually led to becoming a Peace Fellow coming to the United States in 2011. Um, so lots of comments coming in. Um, so I'll just ask a question about the Rotary Priest Fellow, then I'll bring in some more comments. So um, in full transparency, Rotary does advertise with us. I've taught in the program many times. You know, I think it's one of the world's top fellowships. They offer both a full master's degree, which is what Kiran did, and they have um, a couple of professional training programs, two and a half months. So if you're looking for a way to upskill, check it out, little promotion for Rotary. Um, can you say a little bit about, you know, I mean, you were you are a past fellow and you probably helped others get the fellowship. Like, what did you learn in the fellowship? Why people might want to apply? And then also just you went from, you know, Scotland to North Carolina and then eventually rural Tennessee. Um, so just a little bit about your own experience being a migrant and adapting storytelling cultures to a, a much different environment. Um, and just any tips for people who are thinking about the Rotary Fellowship? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, my parents were refugees when they were expelled from East Africa and had 48 hours to leave the country. They couldn't take their houses, their money, their possessions, their objects, but no one can ever take away your stories. And that's what they formed. They used to form their relationships in a very different environment back then. But it was also the thing that was passed on to me. So when I was bullied in the playground called Smelly Immigrant, or whatever, and said to go back home, I would. I would run across the street. And there was my mother standing at the front door because we lived right across the street. And she would tell me all these stories about where I came from, the idea that I come from warriors. I come from freedom fighters. I come from people that have persevered. I come from a faith tradition. And she told me these, reminded me of these stories. And so the idea that even when I came to the United States, even though I didn't know anybody, at the time, and I was about to embark on this two-year fellowship, is this idea that I came with, you know, 50 kilograms of weight. That was all I could take. But I also had all these stories that I could use. Not, I'm not sort of using it that we constantly have to use it as a tool, but just the idea of building connections. That if you believe in this idea that we're all connected as one family, not in a hippy-dippy sense, but we actually are, there's, a, there's something that binds us all, an essence that binds us all then it's a journey of that discovery, you know, and you build those relationships and you realize that, that, you know, all of us across the world are longing for very similar things. You know, we go through pain and struggle, but we all want to feel a sense of belonging and connection. 
sense of community and we're all envisioning what a world well i hope to think we are envisioning a world that is free from conflict or violent conflict and so underpinning this is that you can find the comparative you can find the connections and you can build empathy and understanding and connection with anyone the rotary peace fellowship was a wonderful incredible opportunity to connect with 10 other peace fellows from sudan colombia from uh, australia all over the world and we were we became a family and we were very from different backgrounds we had if different disciplines but we got to work together and create together and think together um and and imagine together and that fellowship gave me that opportunity it's a wonderful fellowship there are many other fellowships as well and i always really encourage people to think about those fellowships and don't hesitate to apply you never know the first time i applied i didn't get it they were like i don't know why i didn't get it i was terrible at the gd what do you call it the the GRE, the GRE, or, GRE. and yeah. I second time I applied, I said I'm going to fail the GRE, and I was terrible at math. And the professor was like, "We don't care about the GRE. We we like your experience in traditions and folklore and what your lived experience. And that's what landed me that position, that opportunity. And it was the Rotary Peace Fellow also gave the opportunity to do things that I'd never done before. It challenged me. You know, when I landed, one opportunity was to go and train troops at Fort Benning, the School of the Americas. And here I was as an anti-war activist, now training in one of the most controversial military bases. But what I learned is that everywhere you go, you can always find connections, even with people, commanders at Fort Benning. And I, I got to do that. I got to train these troops on storytelling as nonviolent communication. And I built incredible relationships with them. And uh, and I would stand by that idea, even whatever, whoever's in power, government or whatever, there's always people that are working behind the scenes and there's always ways that we can connect. Okay. Oh, and then yeah, obviously then two years later, I uh, decided that, you know, United States was a place, I, I think I came here initially to influence American foreign policy and I'm still kind of doing that. But then I also said, fell in love with the culture and the people and realized that there's not, once you get to know people, accents go away differences go away and you start building real relationships and you fall in love with people and i wanted to it's not just influence in foreign policy because now i'm part of it as an american citizen i still want to influence because i care about what i think the united states has the potential to be the greatest peace player in the world we just have to think about what is our assets our cultural assets to be able to us to help us to do that and build relationships with our friends from around the world Wonderful. Um, so two comments, then I'll bring in some questions. So I 100% agree that I mean, Rotary Peace Fellowship is great. There's hundreds of others. And I was lucky I had good mentors. And so one of my mentors, I did junior abroad in Hungary right after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And one of my mentors, when I came back, said, apply for Fulbright. And I was like, that's for important people. And she was <laughs> persistent. And you know, I've had multiple fellowships and do a lot of fellowship advising. And if you get into the mindset of like there's lots of opportunities and figure out how your skills and experience could match fellowship providers and do really good applications and you know don't just do it overnight and if you get feedback from others and you know i get rejected from lots of things but fellowships changed my life and you know it's one of the best ways too many people think about professional development either internships paid work or formal training and there's all kinds of fellowships for artists and storytellers and business people that doesn't always involve you know, going to school. And so I just, I would encourage people to add that. I don't, I don't want to use the word arsenal because that's too militaristic, but let's say that that arena of opportunities to right. their, the thing about, and pro fellows are great resource. We put a lot on PCN, Rotary. There's so much out there, um, but a lot of people don't even consider fellowships or they think that's not the right opportunity. So Stephanie has a question. I think she's based in Virginia. How can we support and encourage the storytelling and amplifying of those voices in more rural, rural areas where the community networks such as museums do not exist yet? Hmm. It's interesting because I, I guess, um, I mean, there are museums in rural spaces. They might be less dense and populated than say the National Mall in DC or, or the Prado Museum in, you know, in Madrid or 
Reno Sofia or these or the British Museum and and actually the the most powerful museums and cultural institutions are the community museums and I've learned that not the British Museum not the National Museum of Scotland it's Anacostia in DC it's the Museum of Folk Life in Virginia it's uh, and it's the ideas of uh, there are also a lot of I mean I as a rural activist now I say rural practitioner and I someone called me that you know a few years ago and I was like am I I guess I am, but there's so much. And one of the things that I guess there's this sort of uh, squashing this idea that we have to move to a big city. We don't. There's so much beauty in rural spaces, so much heritage and ideas and thinking that happens in in rural spaces. And there's a lot of these values that are still really important here in Appalachia, where storytelling is really valued, but so are traditional values, you know. Um, and I think. You know, it's about there's a there's an idea in folklore as a folklore, as we say, digging where you stand. It actually comes from a social movement, but a lot of the answers to the solutions exist in the places that we live when we we pay attention when we look. It's a bit like permaculture that we don't impose the plants or the shrubs. We look and we see what should naturally be growing there, and when we look and pay attention, we cultivate that. And in rural spaces, it's incredible cultural assets things we can see things we can't and when we cultivate those values and those traditions and ways then i think that we create the museum the museum beyond walls and and yeah i i really much i mean i'm not i also work in urban spaces but also i think there's a lot of beauty in small and small is big and and uh and powerful and that can really be cultivated in these in these in these spaces yeah well, Juliet, I think based in I think based in Europe has a question when you're talking about the School of the Americas, and just for people who don't know, Fort Benning, you know, has a track record, particularly in the '80s, but not exclusively, of bringing lots of military people from Latin America to be trained by U.S. military, and then, you know, all sorts of things. But then a big part led to, I could say, the U.S. played a role in a massive amount of human rights violations because the troops they trained often, some of them would go back and do horrible things. Still, still yeah. happens today, but not as bad. So Juliet's asking, now I'll broaden this out, when you're working with School of Americas or any any place, I guess, how do you decide what is a space where you feel okay engaging? And do you, like for people who are trying to decide, like, do I work for an oil company or a military contractor or, or Exxon or Philip Morris, like how do people decide or your recommendations on how do you decide what is appropriate to engage with, at least for you? And maybe sometimes if someone approaches you and says, you don't have to name any particular organization, but something like, no, this is not an appropriate use of storytelling or your skills, or it feels more exploitative. Like your thoughts on that, when to engage and when maybe it's better not to. There is 100% places that are exploiting storytelling, 100%. I'm not, it, I don't sit on the fence on this one. Um, storytelling is a sacred art. It's an ancestral art. It's an indigenous practice. Um, and when I see fracking companies and oil companies and governments using it in a way to manipulate, then they need to be called out. It's a, it's the Jedi force, and it can be used both for good and bad. Peace builders are the Jedi warriors, right? And we have to cultivate, not to gain, not to persuade, not to get. We have to be very much, even if we've got social causes that we feel are very good, we have to be very intentional about what we're using, which ultimately belongs to people it's like the british museum people many years ago they went out and co collected or stole these cultural objects some had good intentions but what happened many years later it still displays this idea a story is a cultural ob object we have to respect it we have to understand these are people this belongs to people when i went to fort benning let's take fort benning as an example i had a friend in chapel hill that said why are you going to that place they're the enemy I said, well, that's interesting, because when I left Scotland, people said, why are you going to that place, America? They're the enemy. And I didn't believe in that. I said that in every place, you will find people where you can work with good people in every place. And so I knew with this idea, but what I was doing in Fort Benning wasn't to, I wasn't training on a, on a government manual. I was invited because I had an opportunity to help commanders some of them had 150 troops under them but they were young 
These are 27, 28 year olds that came from rural communities across America that wanted to serve their country. And what I was trying to do is when you're building relationships with tribal leaders or in different places, what, what stories are you telling? And some of them think, oh, we have to say this story about what we think we tell of our country. But what about the stories of your faith, your family, your communities, your grandmother, your loved ones? Because this is what will build relationships. And when you build relationships, you build a connection, a fellowship. And that fellowship has the potential to prevent conflict from occurring. If we know the person from the other side and we can build that relationship, then we have that potential to work together to solve something. That was the whole goal, is the idea that we all have that potential to, to prevent violent conflict from occurring. If that's the goal, then I'll work with anyone. Does that make sense? I mean, I'll work with anyone. And actually, I thought a lot of the young, this was, this was men in this particular space, but a lot of these young men were really cared about making a difference, and they cared about what the world thought about them. And I always thought that was really beautiful because many, it's not that common when someone say, what does the world think about us? And I come from Britain and no one asked that. <laughs> we kind of have a little bit of arrogance in the UK, you know, where it's like, well, we're the British Empire, you know, even in India, you know, but here's someone that said they really care about what the world thinks about them. And that shows me there's humility. And if with that humility, there's an opportunity to build that relationship. They wanted to build a relationship with the world. And I think that's the story behind the story that I was presented, that we're this sort of military machine. There's actually a lot of beauty in that, this idea of desire and discovery. Um, so, so one quick question, and um, I'll bring in Helen's question. So I've, I've been fortunate enough to accompany live in many places, travel, work, and accompany many people where their story is the right story and someone else's story, whoever is perceived as the opposite or the other is the wrong story. And often in peace building or storytelling or dialogue processes, there's this magic moment where people start to realize their story is a powerful story, but there's something to learn from this other story and people become more humanized. It's one of the most magical things in life. Mm -hmm. Or it could, it could be when I'm fighting with my wife, I think I'm right, you know, and I get I get out of my right, like, I'm right, you're wrong. And she has a PhD in conflict resolution, too. And then I get out of my rightness and be like, well, I have a perspective and there, but it's also important to acknowledge and understand this doesn't mean. So any thoughts about how do you get to that point? And particularly when you're thinking about larger level of change, because relationships are incredible, but we're all embedded in institutions. Have you seen that kind of narrative or story change or de-othering happen more at a larger level, like in an institution or a policy? Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a strong belief that there's no such thing as a fictive narrative if a story holds truth for the teller. It's up to us how we think about truth, right? Everybody is searching for truth. We scroll our phones because we're searching for truth. We're trying to get to the human story. But it's actually how we listen to it. If we listen in a way with the intention to understand what is meaningful to another human being, then we're it's their truth. I don't believe the world was made in seven days as a creation. Story. But if that story is important to an individual and I'm going there to convince them, then I, maybe I shouldn't be in that conversation. What I should be doing is listening in a way. It's like, what's important to you? What's your beliefs? What's your values? How do you see the world? because that will give me an understanding to build that space. From a policy level, I think when I had, an, I talked about Friends Committee of National Legislation, and I remember in 2016 when they reached out along with Melanie Greenberg and the Alliance for Peace Building and some others because they wanted to, they wanted some help in introducing a piece of policy. And I, because I was in Tennessee and I was connected to the, well, the, state senator senator corker bob corker who was chairman of the foreign relations i managed to get a meeting organized at the senate in washington dc but i as we we're walking to the senate and i was asking who's in charge of this meeting and they looked around and said you are and that was kind of intimidating but we went to that meeting what was supposed to be a 10-minute meeting 
ended up being more than an hour. This was one week after the national election in 2016. And you know who was voted in as president. We sat around that table and I simply asked a question to everyone in that room. I said, what was the moment that made you think differently about the world and wanted you and, and enabled you to become a peace builder? Not your Democrat story, not your Republican story, not your binary. What was the moment that connected you to want to make a difference? That led to an hour long discussion, a heartfelt discussion. And at the end of the meeting, Corker's staff member, chief of staff was said, this is a bipartisan initiative. We support it. And that led to um, the Ellie Weasel Mass Atrocities Genocide Prevention Act two years later became US law and has the potential to save millions of people's lives and really values training uh, as opposed to that violent conflict training. And so I like to think that was introduced partly through a very ancestral story circle. In, I didn't call it story circle, but very ancestral indigenous practice of listening for understanding, finding meaning and transcending politics. And I think the idea we can do that in many different spaces, but if we go to that kitchen table where the best conversations happen with the intention to convince and persuade, then maybe we shouldn't be there. But if we go with the intention to understand, to connect with our humanity, the emotions, the values, what's important, then we build a more sustainable, longer term understanding that we can do this together, not necessarily, I'm going to try and convince you. Mm -hmm. That's the most powerful aspect of storytelling. So if people have not looked up the work of Search for Common Ground, it's you know one of the largest independent peace building organizations in the universe. Um, just go to searchforcommonground.org. They use media and storytelling and music and many, you know, TV, radio. Um, and just often what they'll do is they, they did a project, this is going back 25 years, 30 years ago, is, you know, different perspectives on abortion is a huge conflictual issue in the US, lots of lots of places. And they created with others something called the Network for Life and Choice. And when they brought people together, they didn't say, are you pro-choice or are you pro-life or you know, anti-choice or anti whatever terminology you want to use. They said, what they started off the conversation much more, what beliefs led you to, like what experiences led you to have a belief? And they humanized and they're never going to agree. I mean, I, I have friends who work for Planned Parenthood and other people think the exact opposite. They're never going to agree, but they found creating empathy and understanding about the beliefs and they found out where they could work together actually led to reduction in violence in the cities where this was happening, some of them, and also they could work on some joint policies. Doesn't mean they would stop fighting each other, you know, because on their fundamental policy differences, but that that's a, if you look up their work, there's a lot of interesting things like that. And I, my son came home the other day, somebody was driving home from school and he's like, this guy said, I won't get to too much into politics, but he said, the driver of the car had a very different opinion of my son about like president in Colombia and also the president you know, Trump. And he's like, Trump is a great president. And my son's like, came home and said, this guy is wrong. How do I convince him he's wrong? And like, you know, I'm right. And he's like, I, you know, and it was interesting because I said like, you know, obviously personally, I, I think Trump is horrific, but there's a lot of people who do believe in what he's saying. And so like, if you go to a guy and say you're wrong, nothing's ever going to happen. But how do you just try to understand? You don't have to agree with him and he can take action, but how do you kind of understand where that person's coming from? But let, let's bring in a question from Helen, um, I think from South Sudan. So thanks for joining us. How do you present the difficult realities of people and communities in ways that are more positive and empowering? And I guess I would broaden that question out a little bit. If someone is working, whether it's fundraising for a humanitarian organization or trying to help, at, you know, whether it's Yemen or Ukraine or Syria or Colombia, all the places where there's so many challenges in the world, how do you try to take stories in context where there's a lot of difficulty and not objectify or like when you're working in really challenging context, whether it's to advocate for political action or fundraising, like what are your thoughts around ethical engagement? I mean, ethics of storytelling is so really, really important. And I think, I think it's very much if anyone is thinking about stories or the use of storytelling and the application of storytelling, then I think getting a sense of the ethical power of that firsthand as much as one can. I mean, it's also, you know, there are, you know, might be courses on ethics of storytelling or ethics in general, but I think it's going with the idea of doing no harm, doing 
and and not trying to impose and recognizing there is beauty that already exists um knowledge that already exists in colombia in sudan there are traditions that are important to those communities and i you know me from the west kind of going in with this is the how we do it that's wrong it's recognizing that there are traditions and wisdom and knowledge that exists in those communities and and it's a more about how do we create the safe the spaces in which those stories can be elevated amplified supported um there are it's a longer perhaps conversation about the idea of you know objective objectification i think one one would have to kind of like go on a bit of a deeper dive on some processes for that um but i would i would really think about what i what i really would encourage peace builders humanitarian growth is stop just thinking about stories at the end of a project right, we've done the work here's the data now let's tell a story from it because story is data it's one of the most powerful forms of data it is qualitative at the forefront and really think about if i'm going to go and work in this space let me think about how to embed storytelling from the forefront the kitchen table how do i create a space that's not about me telling the story it's about communities telling their stories their own stories in ways that are meaningful the ways that are important so they select you empowering storytellers to become the storytellers of any project and thinking about that creativity the storytelling process at the beginning recognizing what storytelling traditions exist in that community already and and and, and supporting that you know what folk traditions what rituals what what is um what is part of that soul of that place i remember meeting uh, somebody craig you might actually been at this meeting but it was in dc and there was somebody that had worked an american uh peace builder former army person that lived in afghanistan for 10 years and worked in afghanistan his job was to kind of support uh, young people from joining the taliban etc but he said he wasn't until he'd been there for 10 years and understand the poetry i think it was prashtali and understand the poetry of that place that you can really truly make a difference you have to understand the poetics of place of people the traditions and customs not kind of coming with this western perspective of i'm going to go and extract and go and show and go because the knowledge exists already maybe we use our power in the west perhaps to help relinquish that power and share those resources so communities know how to make that change in ways that may, perhaps many have been doing for hundreds of years wonderful i mean I, I, two comments then i'll get to roger's question and we have about 10 more minutes um I, I think when i started working in peace building or change i was more naive and like not that i'm going to show you but like the us has a lot to teach others and the longer I've been doing this, one more jaded, but two also just realized that we have so much, everybody has so much to learn from each other. And if it's like, hey, you know, what what's going on here? What can I learn from you? Maybe something else, you know, from another country or context, I might have some insights, but the idea is I'm gonna come and train you like in five steps, how to do conflict resolution. It's just ridiculous. Right. And, uh, you know, and the US is, is such a mess that if we had more humility and say, hey, we've got you know, like, yes, we're great at, you know, innovation and technology and medicine, some areas, but like we are doing really poorly in other areas and we can learn from, you know, Bogota or Medellin or like so many other countries, like what, what can we learn together? That's where the real power mm -hmm. comes in. Um, so a quick question from Raj based in Boulder. I know he works on virtual reality and storytelling and does a lot of stuff in India. What happens when stories contradict the truth? what to do and I'll, I'll just add a comment there so i spent a lot of time in southeastern europe in the early 90s you know and i saw i was in yugoslavia pre-war during the war you know post-war the different republics and countries but what also like what happens when there's like an official narrative whether it's nationalist or exclusionary because mm. you know, if you think about the world right now a lot of strong particularly strong men not only are trying to say this is the story that should be imposed or believed as a country and if you challenge that story which usually artists do um, you're going to wind up in jail executed or in exile so any thoughts about like both the dominant story that 
people in power might say should be said, or just when a story is obviously, at least based on fact, not true. I mean, there are some powerful narratives that are manipulating, destroying. I mean, that's the kind of idea is when it's, again, when going back to the ancestral and the indigenous, what we could consider the sacred practice. I mean, Nazi Germany stories as used as propaganda. It's been happening for, you know, I think Nazi Germany were almost like they were using it in that particular way from the flight to Nuremberg and many of the, you know, using it in filmmaking a lot, but it's happening in India too with the Modi's government. Um, so I'd say, you know, it's a long-term process. Peace building, storytelling are nebulous movements. We don't always see the result straight away, but doesn't mean it's not happening. And um, and I often think that the power of what can happen when we get face-to-face -face conversations, face-to-face -face can be Zoom too, but we take out the middle man, we take out the media, we give people or try to find a way in which people can cultivate um, and share in fellowship in a safe way, in a vulnerable way. And it might seem like, oh, how does this single story, how does this experience challenge that bigger narrative? But what that single story is doing in that fellowship is igniting movements, connections that can lead to greater change, I feel. So it's storytellers have been silenced been silenced for a long time right and it's colonialism has you know been part of that you know um it's happening now you know and it's it's those with the resource and the technologies war in the future is going to be bots speaking to bots that is unfortunately so we have to counter that with the idea of like it's almost like a return to our older ways when we think of storytelling let's think of it as the collective when we think of multiculturalism remember that true multiculturalism is the integration of diverse ideas and even ideas that we feel uncomfortable with right it's a comp we're not trying to create a simplified world we're trying to create a more complex world a diverse world multiple ideas it can be messy too and chaotic but that's what we're creating in this chaotic <laughs> garden. And so I think it does need to be challenged, but also don't underestimate the power of a single story and how that can, the power of that single story or a single moment and how that can um, be incredibly powerful. You know, when I think about even the war in Ukraine, when I was, again, scrolling my phone, looking at all this, searching 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 i stopped and i found there was a one single story about a mother that was sitting at a dining table and she took a photo of a cup of tea and a cake and she wrote this piece from the bunker because she was about to have you know a friend over for tea but had to write it and so i i really latched onto that because it gave me a sense of this human experience of one individual that i could relate to and that overrided, at least in my thinking, in my, and that can that can resonate with different people in different ways. And I really think it's important when we also think about the story where we're creating, whether we're doing public speaking or conversations, thinking very intentionally about how we're using that to connect to someone's value, the values of the other that connects to the idea of struggle, pain, the search for love, connection, search for meaning the desire to be loved, the desire to love, sense of belonging. And I think when we can, can connect to that or find a way to connect, and often that comes through the personal experience. You know, it's Marshall Gans's story of us, the story of self and value as a starting point to connect with other people's values. It's, it's not necessarily that like you counter it. It's creating something that is beautiful, connecting core to our humanity, core to values, and cultivating that, I believe, in a way that could um, grow as a movement. Going back to Mar Margaret Mead's, you know, the power of what a small group of people can do to change the world. And it also means that a small group of people can be a, a conversation between people to create 
something that can be very, very powerful once shared. So, so one quick story from my time in Bosnia. I, I was I was there a few months after, maybe like 12 months after the war, but this is when I went back to do my dissertation. Um, you know, during the worst, I mean, the war is horrific in Sarajevo and all over the country. And one of the things that's interesting, often in severe conflict, artists provide like resistance, resilience, humanity. So they speak out, they organize, but they, I think it was 93, they organized the first or second Sarajevo International Film and Theater Festival in the middle of a war. And hmm. you know, there's thousands of cells falling down. And Susan Sontag went there and performed Waiting for Godot. Like a lot of international artists helped too. And they asked the director, I don't remember which journalist asked the director, um, Munir and Gornblank and his last name, how can you have a film festival and theater, theater festival in the middle of the war? And his response was, how can they have a war in the middle of our film festival? <laughs> like, so it's like, again, like it doesn't stop the suffering any bit, but it's like, you know, there should not be any war, but just somehow people choosing to live their lives Mm. Even under, it's one of the most powerful stories you know. remind, that reminds me a little bit of uh, a colleague of mine I worked with in Northern Ireland called Anthony Buckley that used mm. to run um, the curator of the Museum of Folk Life and Traditions he said during the 30 year war in Northern Ireland a lot of the museums became oases of calm because it wasn't necessarily about presenting or provoking a conversation it was creating a space where people got to interact on a natural level in a natural way because they didn't have that opportunity to do that in other places churches pubs everything was siloed but here are places where we create an oasis of calm when people feel calm when they feel safe incredible things can happen when people get to interact naturally okay um so i'm going to bring in maybe two more questions then we'll start to wrap up um so i don't have this person's name my apologies but any suggestion, I think you've talked about this, but you know, whether it's individuals or an organization or community, how do any tips on how to build more authentic, open and transparent conversations? Yeah. Um, you know, I think about when you go into a project, maybe cultivating personal story is important, but also how do you cultivate and support everybody as a storyteller in that sense and there are tools and methods and ideas and can be as we said like artistic intervention um i have a toolkit on my website you're welcome to use called telling stories that matter and it's there are some methods where you might begin a project with a kitchen table you begin a project with 10 questions you you begin to sort of allow people to or collect stories in a way that people can use their own stories or see the power of their own stories to build fellowship and connection um i think there are you know multiple you know tools and techniques like you know there's a even photo voice is a is a storytelling method and i think simply giving the idea of cameras um and you know maybe encouraging I mean, I did a project where the British Council, where there were 10 deaf youth from Syria and 10 deaf youth from Scotland, and they got to sort of at least literally just tell the story through digital means in Arabic sign language and Scottish sign language, and I think it was Syrian sign language, and they got to communicate. But the first thing they did was photograph their homes and their communities, 10 photographs, and then talk about each photograph ultimately they're telling the story of their day or their experience of their neighborhoods. And I think that the idea, imagine sort of scaling that up in a different way in a community that you're part of or you're working with. Simple idea. It's a really simple idea, but that's a storytelling project. Um, you know, when, when we did museum work back in Scotland, and you remember that, you know, there's large areas of 15 miles of extreme poverty, you know, in Glasgow, but we took some of the most famous artwork from Salvador Dali and we put them into neighborhoods in the streets and put kitchen tables and and had community conversations in that way, break down the walls in that sense, literally. Um, and I think thinking about that is just simply thinking about how can I think and embed storytelling as a practice in everything I do at the forefront of my work. Here's my project. Here's my goals. Now let me think about embedding stories so that ultimately individuals get to share 
and learn and listen in this very natural way and they get to build the fellowship and i think that's really core to whether it's three people are in a corner of a bar or it's three different groups that have yet to kind of connect and meet it scales up it scales down but the process is core to who we are barbara meinerhoff mm-hmm. jewish astrologers say we are homo narrans narrative is part of our dna it's core to our human experience so it's we just embed it in part of the experience of the projects that we're thinking think of that you're igniting creativity allow creativity to flourish okay um so one quick story then i'll just finish up with two questions and again i put kiran's website it's kiransingsira.net you can find it you know and i'll put this in the show notes um you know so I, we live in medellin cut my wife kathleen is from bogota we moved here almost six years ago um i've been coming to Colombia for 20 years so medellin obviously was one of the most violent cities in the universe i mean horrific violence i have students who family you know, like i've had students whose families were dis- family members were disappeared or killed and it's interesting because there's a part of the city called Comuna Tresa, which was one of the more, there's lots of violent places, but it's become a place now where probably a thousand tourists come a day for tours of this community. It's, it's you know, over commercialized, but it's gone from this place of like, there was a military operation there that just, you know, heavy military under President Uribe that killed hundreds and disappeared many in the early 2000s. And now it's a place where tourists come from all over the world and they they have graffiti and art and music and dance and you know, still lots of challenges there, but it's like, it's gone from one of the most violent places in one of the most violent cities in the world to this place where thousands of people are coming, probably a hundred thousand people a year are coming from outside of Colombia to, to learn from this community. I mean, we're going to have someone on our podcast to, who works in that area, but it's interesting because things can change, but so three questions. Um, and thank you, Lena, for joining us, Stephanie, um, Raju, he said that has lots of, um, lots of great suggestions here. So, so three quick questions, or maybe they're not quick, but one is for people who want to dive more into kind of narratives and storytelling, any advice, like where do you go for training or communities or learning or inspiration? Like any, like, do you have a network or a conference or a place where that you feel at home that people who want to either learn with and from others or share their experience, you know, a website, a podcast, like wh- where do you recommend people go to kind of be up to date about what others are doing and maybe share their own experience? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we're everywhere in the world, at least, well, not everywhere in the world, but I really encourage you people to sort of join a kind of like a local storytelling association club to kind of just get the opportunities to kind of think with artists and creatives and storytellers that are, you know, if you're in Kenya, I would say go to see my friend Wangari Grace, who's uh, one of incredible storytellers in Kenya, you know, um, uh, but in every community, there are like tradition bearers, you know, don't think about it just as the professional storyteller that's mastered some sort of, think about who are your tradition bearers in every community, who have been historically been the sort of the people that have kept the stories, preserved them, and see the value in that, many of which are our elders, and, you know, sit at their feet and learn from those people and see the beauty and the value of that. Um, listen. The more we, storytelling ultimately teaches us to listen. Um, but also the more we listen, the more we start to understand then the, the, the ways in which stories can be shared and cultivated. You know, and you don't underestimate your own power as a storyteller. One of the projects that I do, one of the things that I do is after an experience, when I did a project in Charleston after the massacre that took nine people's lives at an African-American church by white supremacists, and I was asked to do a, run a healing program. Now, I'm coming in from the outside, but really, I, I really learned so much, and I was really forced humbled right, by a community and it was really a powerful experience for me like when i came back home i was like numb for days and people kept asking me oh, what was the experience like what happened and i couldn't talk about it but what i did do is i sat alone and i wrote on my laptop i opened my laptop and i asked myself five questions just simple describe poignant moments who did i meet what changed in me and i put my laptop down and i gave myself a chance to answer my own questions 
and I, I wrote, I free flowed, wrote to myself, because that was an important part of the process. And then when I got, started to make sense of what was going on, I could speak about it. I could talk about it. And I had with the intention, like, I want to start sharing stories that show the power of that community, the people, et cetera. So there's that. And I would really suggest to any storyteller is um, keep a journal. Keep a journal on any experience. Keep a journal, daily journal. When I worked with nurse practitioners that were dealing with the crisis and the pandemic, I said, like, in 100 years from now, when we look back at this moment, we don't necessarily interested in the Fox News or the CNN story, the BBC. I'm interested in you as a nurse practitioner on the front lines of change. What was it like for you? As you, That's who we relate to. So remember, you are a storyteller. And think about your journal. It doesn't have to be a full breath. Just record your experiences. Record the details. Create the visual. And I... What you're basically doing, you're feeding, you're feeding your cultivation, this cultivation, you're watering the permaculture, what already exists inside of you. And that will bring out, and when, before you know it, when you sit with your loved one and you, the loved one, the one that you trust, your grandma, your spouse, you will talk about it in a conversation. Don't think about it like the beginning, middle, and end, it has to be a TED talk. Uh -uh. It's a conversation. It can take over a period of time but cultivate that by trying to make sense it for yourself why does it matter what's important how did it move your heart when you get to the core of that that's your storytelling thank you so much so last question and thank you for going a little bit over um oh, yeah. so so actually so two parts of the question so first is you have a lot of experience and wisdom so if people want to engage with you? Are you teaching, doing any work, public workshops on storytelling and art or your do consultancies? And if people want to learn more, they go to your website or should, do you have a newsletter? Like where, where's the best people, place for people just to follow your work? And then if they're interested in exploring the services that you offer, where do they go? Yeah, if you want to just reach out, um, my website is there, Kieran Singh Sarah. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and all that malarkey. But I also, I mean, I don't necessarily just do courses. I generally work with institutions or organizations that where I might go and do workshops in a place or, or you know, I'm going to be in D.C. next month. This week I'm going to be in Kentucky, Hazard, Kentucky. A lot of these workshops are free. Sometimes they're free where, like, they pay for me to be there and they open it up to the community. Um, and that way I can sort of do a bit of a deeper dive, in which it's not an hour workshop. It's maybe a three day or a two day or at least a half a day to get a deeper sense of how to begin. But, um, you know, feel free to reach out, you know, and connect. And I'm happy to sort of share resources as, as it, you know, what, what might be available that I've got at least. Um, I'm not, I'm not really, uh, right now I'm not doing any sort of, courses i might do in the future but i'm kind of i'm personally working on some new stuff that i i want to develop like learning how to do a podcast i've never done and uh working some artist collaborations and i'm doing some front power of the porch storytelling mm -hmm. as well in my own community and and you're also a master chef i wish i could come and sample your food so <laughs> <laughs> i'm providing food ways with storytelling as well where we kind of use indian food to break down and bring different people together and I'm doing it on my front porch, starting starting from home. But what I hope to do is like put that into maybe a podcast in a way that feels very accessible, but give that as an opportunity, as a guideline for how people can do that in their own front porches or their own gardens or their own community centers. So I try to do that as much as I can and write up about my experiences. But, you know, I'm just one person. There are many other storytellers that do this. I'm just one person that has a particular perspective. So... And I think the wisdom exists, again, in all communities, your tradition bearers, your artists, your creatives, your quilt makers in every community. So I seek them out, seek out the artists in all communities. OK, so thank you very much, Kiran, for generously sharing your time, energy, wisdom and poetry and stories. Um, it was really powerful. And thank you, everyone, from joining us from Nigeria to Brussels to mm -hmm. I mean, all over. It was wonderful. Your questions and comments, please follow Kiran 
either on LinkedIn or Facebook or Insta. Um, look at his website. There's lots of resources there. Please consider rating the podcast. Um, and then hopefully Kiran will launch a podcast so you can rate and share his. And have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. A few comments are coming in. And um, just lots of people are saying thank you so much. Yeah. And the power of food, actually, I'm not going to do another dissertation. But I used to think often the most powerful connections do happen at post-event, whatever the event is, when people are eating or being together. And it'd be a great way to, you know, um, so people are just sharing lots of thank you. So thank you so much, Kiran. Have a wonderful day. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a so have a good afternoon.